Welcome to uh, RAL seminar. This is our first hybrid seminar since before COVID. We've been fully virtual for the last two years, so it's great to actually be back in this room uh, and, and doing a seminar. So welcome to those of you who are here in person in 1022 and also those of you who are watching on the webcast. Uh, and so uh, after the seminar, we'll have uh, questions like usual, both here in the room, just raise your hand and I'll pass the microphone along. And if you're watching online on the webcast, below the webcast, there should be uh, a Slido form where you can uh, just type in your question. Uh, please use your name as well so we know who you are. Um, and uh, we have a monitor here in the room, and so we'll be able to see those questions as well. And um, we'll get to all the questions as there is time. So to introduce our speaker, our speaker today is Kamal Chandrakar. Um, Kamal is an advanced study program postdoctoral fellow in M-cubed here at NCAR. He earned his PhD in atmospheric sciences in 2019 from Michigan Technological University, where he worked in the Pi cloud chamber. Before that, he received a master's in mechanical engineering from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Kamal's research interest includes experimental, theoretical, and high-resolution numerical modeling studies of cloud and precipitation physics, microphysics, aerosol cloud turbulence intersections, moist convection, and turbulence. Kamal, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jared, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you for having me here. Hello, everyone. Today, I'll present some of my work related to aerosol cloud interactions. And specifically, I'll be focusing on uh, the microphysical interactions and their implication for large-scale cloud properties and uh, processes. So in this work, I'll uh, um, try to provide perspective from um, uh, control about the experiment at Michigan Tech Pi Chamber and some stochastic theory, and as well as from numerical modeling. Um, um, using DNS as well as LES models. So before I begin, I'd like to uh, acknowledge contribution from Michigan Tech Pi Chamber Group, especially uh, my PhD advisor, Raymond Shaw and Will Cantrell, uh, as well as my colleagues and uh, mentors at INCAR, Hugh Morrison, Wade Grabowski, and George Brand. So clouds are a critical element of our Earth system, and it uh, um, and it plays an important role in our uh, weather and climate uh, uh, system and forcing. So understanding cloud in details are important because um, uh, it's a, it's a, it provides physical foundation for uh, their representation in the weather and climate models. Weather and climate models generally have grid resolution, not enough to resolve all the cloud processes. Uh, and uh, so it relies on the parameterization of those processes uh, in this model. So understanding of the cloud at very scale provide physical foundation uh, for some of the assumption in their bulk representation in this large scale models. So um, uh, there was a quote in the recent Physics Today article that reads, the principal sticking point in predicting climate and uh, are, uh, climate are the subgrid scale turbulent and convective motion in the ocean and atmosphere. So subgrid scale representation of uh, cloud turbulence interactions are critical uh, for a climate pre prediction point of view. And uh, uh, so uh, that's, that's my aim to understand how clouds interact at various scales uh, um, and uh, how we can improve their representation in this large scale models. Um, aerosol concentration or aerosol perturbation in different cloud system are important for uh, some of these cloud processes. Uh, for example, uh, aerosol concentration and perturbation can affect the microphysical properties like uh, droplet size distribution. Uh, that's, uh, that's one of the key variables for uh, uh, different, uh, different uh, processes, for example, precipitation formation as well as interaction with the radiation and dynamics. Sorry. So one example of uh, aerosol effect is, uh, in, is, is basically first aerosol index effect where increase in the aerosol concentration uh, can impact the optical properties of the cloud. For example, if you have higher concentration that lead to higher optical depth of the cloud and uh, reflect more solar radiation. And uh, this is because of the increased competition for water vapor when you have higher 
aerosol concentration that lead to production of small cloud droplet at higher concentration. So that, uh, so that cloud become optically depth in those regions. Uh, also, it also, uh, it also affects the precipitation formation in those regions. So when the cloud droplets are small, um, the autoconversion rates are also smaller in those regions. So um, there's more, less precipitation formation um, compared to the region where you have a, a slightly lower aerosol concentration and a, a larger cloud particle that uh, initiate the precipitation and drizzle formation. Apart from aerosol, uh, uh, clouds are turbulent in nature, and the aerosol uh, uh, and the turbulent fluctuation impact the microphysical properties. Um, so, in the turbulent environment, not just the velocity field fluctuates, but also the uh, scalar quantities like uh, water vapor and temperature fluctuates, and that affects the uh, precipitation development and uh, uh, as well as the uh, other uh, uh, mic uh, other properties of the cloud. So in this talk, I'll be focusing mainly on the impact of uh, turbulent fluctuations uh, at various scale on uh, different cloud properties, especially dropper size distribution, and uh, their impact for uh, in, uh, and their impact on the microscopic properties like uh, autoconversion rate and uh, optical properties. So why we we are uh, investigating this because. Uh, Aerosol cloud interaction still remain a large source of uncertainties in our uh, climate forcing, um, uh, according to this recent IPCC report. And so improve understanding of impact of aerosol and turbulence in droplet size distribution would help constrain the aerosol indirect effect, as well, uh, as, well as improve the um, cloud, uh, cloud optical depth parameterization as well as uh, precipitation rate parameterization in large scale models. The uh, Doppler size distribution is also one of the critical assumption in the remote sensing retrieval. So understanding about the understanding the shape of Doppler size distribution would also help uh, improve the uh, retrieval of cloud properties using remote sensing tools. So in first half of my, uh, half of my talk, I'll be focusing on uh, some of the experimental uh, investigation of this uh, aerosol cloud turbulence interaction, as well as some. Uh, uh, theoretical um, investigation uh, using this stochastic model. So I, uh, during my PhD, I did some work in uh, Michigan Tech Pi Chamber, and uh, it's a unique facility where we create cloud by, uh, by con convection. Basically, we uh, create double and moist convection in the chamber and create cloud based on that, um, and, and then study the cloud properties. So in this, uh, in this cloud chamber, we can create cloud for, uh, for a very long time, for example, or uh, we can create cloud for um, one day and then get very uh, long and good statistics of uh, different uh, cloud properties so that uh, uh, we can understand this interaction better. So the first problem uh, here I'm going to present is like how this small scale Dublin fluctuation, especially in the scalar field, affects the Doppler size distribution. So this is the streak line image of a turbulent laboratory cloud. Um, I taken this image using long exposure time of the camera so that um, particle motion forms the streak. Uh, and you can see th this nice vertical structure associated with this turbulent flow. And uh, with this image, you can, um, you can imagine like how much variability a turbulent flow field can cause at different scales. And uh, each particle um, ex ex basically experiences this variability during, throughout their growth uh, time scale. To understand this problem, we, um, we create steady state cloud condition uh, by applying temperature difference between top and bottom boundary. So we make uh, bottom boundary warm and also saturated with water, and top boundary relatively colder and also saturated with water. Since there's a temperature difference between the top and bottom boundary, it drives the um, convecting motion and mixes the air from uh, different boundaries. Since, uh, since we are mixing uh, air at two different temperature, after mixing, it creates a supersaturated condition. Uh, it's because the mixing is a, a linear process, however, the saturation vapor curve is nonlinear. And because of that, there's a, 
uh, additional water vapor than desaturated value. So once we have this uh, steady state saturated condition in the chamber, we inject aerosol particle and, uh, and some of this particle activate once they experience supersaturation more than the critical value for activation. And then they grow in this turbulent environment and they finally sediment out. Since we inject aerosol particle at steady rate, it balances the removal of uh, cloud droplet as well as aerosols and uh, gives steady state cloud property some, after some initial transient phase. So we measure the cloud property during the, uh, during the steady state uh, period and uh, get good statistics of uh, different uh, um, uh, cloud properties, for example, dropper size distribution as well as uh, other uh, thermodynamics as well as uh, turbulent flow uh, properties. We repeat this experiment with different aerosol injection rate too so that we can understand the uh, impact of aerosol in, uh, during the uh, in the interaction between the cl uh, cloud droplet and turbulent flow field. And uh, these two different images from uh, two different experiments. Left one is from the case where we have uh, low concentration of aerosol, and right one is from the, from the case where we inject high uh, concentration of aerosol. And just by looking at this two image, you can see that for the same light source, uh, the one at right side reflect more light uh, and uh, and this is uh, this is a simple demonstration of to me of a aerosol index effect where uh, increased concentration of aerosol uh, leads to production of small droplets at higher concentration and uh, that uh, that lead to more optical depth of the cloud. So we measure droplet size distribution during the steady state period, and here's one example. So these uh, distributions are from uh, five different experiments. So, um, so the injection rate of aerosols for this experiment are shown here. So with, with increase in the aerosol injection rate, the um, mode diameter as well as mean diameter decreases, and uh, that's consistent with the, uh, with the first aerosol induct effect or Toomey effect. However, the interesting part here is the distribution shape. So not just the distribution mode and mean diameter is changing, the distribution width uh, is also changing when we increase the aerosol injection rate. And, and uh, this is important because uh, um, when, when, the, when the width is changing, like it can affect the auto conversion rate and as well as the uh, cloud optical properties. So this, is, uh, this larger spectral width is also con uh, is basically contrasting from traditional picture of adiabatic cloud parcel where uh, condensation lead to an a narrow droplet size distribution. And uh, in a turbulent environment, we get a broad distribution because of the variability uh, in the individual particle growth. This can be understood from the uh, theoretical um, relation. So as I mentioned, like I performed some stochastic uh, modeling and uh, obtained relationship between spectral width and uh, different parameters of the system. So uh, here we found that the spectral width is proportional to supersaturation fluctuation. Uh, and different time scale. Here, tau s is the system time scale, which is basically a combination of turbulent correlation time and the phase relaxation time. And the t is the growth time scale, or uh, you can say the lifetime of the particle in the chamber. So uh, when we, uh, when we did, uh, did this experiment, we fixed the forcing uh, between top and bottom boundary, so turbulent correlation time is fixed for this experiment. However, the phase relaxation time is changing when we change the aerosol injection rate. So for higher aerosol injection rate, the number concentration of droplets are larger, so you get a shorter phase relaxation time. And because of that, system time scale also becomes smaller. Since the spectral width is proportional to the system time scale, you get a narrowing of droplet size distribution when we have a um, higher aerosol con concentration. So essentially, it means that when you have higher aerosol concentration, it buffers the variability in the supersaturation field and uh, produces the uh, narrow uh, spectrum. This growth time scale or lifetime of the particle also plays an important role in the shape of the droplet size distribution uh, because it varies from uh, just activated particle to the, um, to the particle which is uh, uh, which, which has uh, longer uh, time in the chamber. 
And this growth time scale varies uh, with mean supersaturation. So, uh, so mean supersaturation also affects the uh, overall shape of the Doppler size distribution. And the ultimate uh, uh, ultimate shape will uh, depend on the, um, the, the relative magnitude of the fluctuation compared to the mean supersaturation. So to better understand the shape of Doppler size distribution, we formulated Fokker-Planck equation of uh, Doppler size. Uh, and the P, here P is the probability distribution of uh, Doppler sizes. And uh, um, here the right, first term in the right side represent the drift uh, or uh, uh, growth due to the mean supersaturation. The second term represent the diffusion uh, or uh, broadening due to the turbulent fluctuation. Uh, and the third term represents the source of the particles through activation. And uh, the last term is the removal. And in case of the chamber, the most of the removal is because of the gravitational settling. So uh, this uh, tau r, which is removal time scale, that's function of uh, Doppler size. So with the, with the assumption of the strokes removal, we obtain steady state solution um, of this uh, Fokker-Planck equation. And that looks like this. This is an exponential multiplied by an ARI function. Now, to compare this complex form of uh, uh, particle size distribution, um, we, uh, uh, with the measurement, we obtain asymptotic solution by, uh, by considering only larger uh, size particle. And uh, that gives uh, a basically exponential of R cubed. Similarly, we obtain another distribution by assuming uh, fixed removal time scale, and, uh, and that gives a viable distribution with shear factor two. Another distribution uh, we obtain uh, by considering the, um, basically even neglecting this uh, turbulent fluctuation term, only considering the growth due to the mean supersaturation and removal due to the settling, and uh, that it gives slightly narrower distribution with uh, uh, which which has a tail of exponential of r cube uh, r power four, so this is narrower than other two distribution. Now to compare this theoretical shape, uh, we transform all this distribution to a coordinate system such a way that it become a linear function in those coordinates, and uh, similarly we calculated this uh, major distribution in those coordinate system, and then we simplified the linear function. So this is one example. So we repeated this experiment with multiple errors on injection rate, and this is from one, one, of, the, um, one of the case. And in this case, we used nearly monodispersed aerosols, like a very narrow uh, width of uh, aerosol injection, uh, uh, aerosol distribution. And uh, in that case, uh, you can see that the middle panel matches the uh, fit, uh, theoretical fit, uh, reasonably well compared to other two. Um, distribution, and that can also be seen in the residue plot, which is shown in the bottom. So the residues are uh, fluctuating randomly above and below zero line. However, for other two cases, the residues have a clear trend. So that means uh, measurement and this linear fit deviates uh, in the other tail for those two cases. So for the last case, like which is for the solution with fixed supersaturation, uh, residues are large, and then also um, it, uh, the tail uh, the tail is basically um, broad. The measurement is slightly broader than the theoretical uh, shape. So, so that means the fluctuation, the supersaturation, as well as the size-dependent removal is important for determining the shape of Doppler size distribution. Uh, in in this case, when we um, when we did experiment with a broader aerosol spectrum, so we, um, we considered a, a broad um, spectrum of aerosol broader than what we used earlier, and then uh, repeated this experiment uh, with different aerosol injection rates. And in that case, uh, this measurement and theory deviate significantly, uh, even for this optim uh, optimal distribution. The measurements are broader than the, uh, this theoretical solution. And this is because uh, when you look at the Fokker-Planck Fokker equation, when we solve this Fokker-Planck equation, we, uh, we consider this factor A, which is uh, basically function of uh, uh, mean supersaturation, a constant. However, that's not 
uh, true when, when you use the broad spectrum of aerosols. Uh, when you use the broad spectrum of aerosols, there's a curvature and solid effect that, uh, that depends on the size of the particle. And uh, so that assumption is invalid um, for that case. And also the critical radius of uh, droplet size is not uh, fixed when you have a broad spectrum. So the, both, those, uh, both of these assumptions are invalid and because of that uh, we get deviation of the theory uh, from the measurement. So, um, so what is the implication of this work? So this, this work is uh, uh, important because uh, here we showed the turbulent fluctuation is important for determining the shape of the droplet size distribution and that can affect the uh, optical depth parameterization, for example, through this uh, K parameter, which is the ratio between mean volume radius cube and effective radius cube. And this K parameter um, uh, is basically a function of spectral width and the skewness. And this K parameter varies with different uh, aerosol concentration. So better understanding of the shape of dropper size distribution in this uh, turbulent condition uh, and uh, different aerosol regimes would help constrain the um, aerosol index effect as well as uh, also help to improve the um, precipitation rate parameterization in bulk models. Uh, again, this the theoretical shape would also uh, you, it can be useful for uh, improving the re remote sensing retrieval of cloud properties. Now in the second half of my talk, I'll be focusing on the numerical modeling work I started doing at NCAR. Um, so at NCAR, I started working on uh, numerical modeling ranging from direct numerical simulation, where we resolve the smallest Kolmogorov scale eddies uh, of the order of millimeter to, uh, to large eddy simulation of uh, uh, boundary layer cloud system. Uh, and uh, so with different scale of uh, uh, modeling, we try to understand uh, this aerosol cloud interaction better. So before I begin, I'll um, just try to provide basic overview of uh, uh, different microphysical approaches. Um, most of you might be familiar with that, uh, but uh, I'll just try to cover the basics. So in the, uh, there's three different kind of microphysics uh, approaches. One is bulk microphysics, where we assume shape of Doppler size distribution and then obtain different process rate and uh, optical properties based on that assumed shape. There's a bean microphysics scheme where uh, instead of assuming the shape of Doppler size distribution, we discretize the distribution in finite size beans and then advect those beans uh, in Eulerian space uh, as well as solve for their growth um, in Eulerian manner. And there's a third category, which is a Lagrangian particle-based microphysics scheme where uh, um, which is also known as super droplet or super particle scheme. In this scheme, um, the cloud particles are represented by this computational particle, um, uh, and each computational particle represents multiple uh, particles of identical properties. And then we advect and uh, solve for the growth in a Lagrangian manner. So I use this Lagrangian microphysics scheme in large array simulation framework to understand the um, cumulus cloud properties, especially the impact of small scale turbulent fluctuation, as well as internal mixing processes in uh, Doppler size distribution. So as I mentioned, this super droplet or super particle uh, scheme uh, represent, the, uh, uh, represent the real particle of identical properties. And, um, and, uh, and also because of this, uh, um, uh, because of this simplification, we can able to solve uh, this uh, uh, large realistic cloud simulation. In the Lagrangian scheme, the interaction between the particle and the flow as well as thermodynamic fields uh, is Lagrangian in nature, so it's free from numerical diffusion. Unlike the bean scheme where this uh, Eulerian advection of uh, uh, beans lead to uh, numerical challenges like a numerical diffusion. Also, this Lagrangian scheme can represent the aerosol activation and processing explicitly. To represent that in the bean microphysics scheme, we had to have two-dimensional bean approach, and, uh, and that again lead to more numerical problems. 
So we, we implemented this uh, super Doppler scheme in CM1 with uh, some subgrid model for particle transport and super saturation fluctuations uh, based on some earlier work. And uh, we try to understand how the turbulent fluctuation impact the, uh, impacts the cloud properties. So this is uh, one example. So here we, uh, we investigated how the subgrid scale fluctuation of the super saturation uh, affects the uh, different properties like number concentration and spectral width of Doppler size. Um, so this, this is the 2D histogram in vertical direction and uh, the colors are the normalized count and uh, uh, squares are the mean, horizontally average values and uh, bars are t uh, 10 and 90 percentile of the distribution. So in, the, in one case, we use, uh, basically we turn off the subgrid scale fluctuation and uh, uh, in other case, we, uh, we have those uh, uh, subgrid model active. And for the case where there's no subgrid scale fluctuation, we get lower number concentration of droplet near the cloud base. And also uh, the variability is smaller compared to the, uh, right, uh, the case where we have subgrid fluctuations. And this subgrid fluctuation also affect the spectral width. Um, when we use the subgrid model, we can see that uh, the spectral width is larger um, compared to the no subgrid case. And uh, so that means subgrid scale fluctuation um, can affect both number concentration and spectral width. And this is because of the uh, different uh, processes. For example, um, one I explained uh, in the uh, in, in the context of laboratory setting that uh, uh, turbulent fluctuation causes broadening through condensation. And uh, here the broadening is due to the, uh, also due to the uh, activation of the particles. So we also investigated the impact of entrainment mixing processes in the Doppler size distribution. And uh, this is one example, uh, Doppler size distribution from uh, one uh, altitude range, and uh, we classified distribution based on adiabatic fraction. Uh, adiabatic fraction is uh, basically ratio between cloud water mixing ratio and its adiabatic value at particular grid location. Uh, it's, uh, and it quantifies the amount of dilution through entrainment. So the value close to one means the parcel is uh, less diluted and value close to zero means par parcel is highly diluted. So f for uh, for less diluted case, we get a narrow distribution, and with decrease in the adiabatic fraction, uh, we get broadening of distribution, especially in the left side. So you get uh, this uh, this left shoulder developing in the distribution, and for highly diluted region, we get a bimodal shape. This is consistent with the um, observation of shallow cumulus cloud, um, and um, and also some uh, earlier studies. Uh, with simple, simpler models. This bimodal shape, uh, as well as this broadening, is because of the two factor. One, uh, this entrainment lead to variability in the adopted growth history, as well as uh, uh, there's uh, activation of entrained aerosols. So um, here we track the uh, individual particle trajectories, which lead to one target location. And you can see that a lot of trajectories are coming from the cloud base and that correspond to primary mode in Doppler size distribution. But there are also trajectories coming from the side and uh, that lead to uh, production of this smaller mode in the Doppler size. And this is uh, because of the activation of uh, entrained aerosols in, in, the, in the cloud. So we further understand this uh, problem, like how secondary activation, activation, the um, droplet inside the cloud affects the um, different cloud properties. Here we track the entrainment and activation height of different particles. Uh, the left panel shows the 2D histogram uh, with number showing the normalized count. Uh, and the uh, right panel shows the cumulative um, activation and entrainment at different altitude. So you can see there's significant activation near the cloud base and uh, that's almost like 75% of the total activation. And that's because um, when parcel rises, you get sharp increase in the supersaturation near the base and that activate most of the particles. And, but also there's an increase in amount of activation uh, with altitude and, uh, and this activation of 
particle inside the cloud we call secondary activation and that uh, that's almost 25% of the total activation in this case so this is a significant amount and it, this can affect the cloud properties so to understand uh, the impact we did a control run where we turned off the uh, activation above certain altitude um, and then look at the cloud properties so the bottom panel shows the spectral width versus adiabatic fraction um, for those two cases like uh, one case with secondary activation other case without secondary activation so for the case where there is no secondary activation uh, we get smaller spectral width uh, compared to the case where we have secondary activation and also this uh, this increasing trend of the spectral width with increase in the amount of dilution or decrease in adiabatic fraction is uh, weaker uh, when when there is no secondary activation so in when entrainment lead to uh, activation of the new particle and and produces the smaller um, droplet mode and then broadens the overall distribution um, so this is important for uh, overall uh, shape of droplet size distribution so another interesting part here is the this decreasing trend of the spectral width with adiabatic fraction in highly diluted region and this is nearly absent um, for the case uh, where we turned off the secondary activation and this is because in the highly diluted regions this uh, smaller droplet mode dominates and uh, produces a narrow distribution this is consistent uh, with the uh, observation during ist field campaign and uh, um, uh, thanks to andy hansfield for providing the data uh, from for, for this uh, uh, from this field campaign that also shows the similar qualitatively similar trend of the spectral with with adiabatic fraction so you get this decreasing trend here as well so uh, initially i mentioned that the eulerian bean macrophysics uh, have some numerical challenges because of the eulerian advection of the beans and to understand uh, the difference differences between the lagrangian and eulerian bean macrophysics scheme uh, we perform same cumulus congestus cloud simulation using the tau bean macrophysics scheme uh, and then compare it with the Lagrangian simulation. The top plot shows the spectral width of dropper size, and there's a delta R99, basically difference between 99 percentile and 50 percentile of the dropper size distribution. So it's kind of showing the, the width towards the larger size. So for this case, uh, without colli collision coalescence, we get uh, significantly broader dropper size distribution when you use a Eulerian bean microphysics scheme and this this broadening of a uh, distribution for the Eulerian scheme affect the precipitation development significantly so we we did ex, uh, simulation with uh, precipitation formation and we found that um, the, in the bean microphysics simulation precipitation form early and also intens intensify with the time uh, and at later time also there's a significant difference in the magnitude of the precipitation between the Lagrangian and the Eulerian bean microphysics. So uh, this bean microphysics are generally used for um, parameterizing a different uh, process rate, uh, for example, autoconversion and accretion rate. So we had to be careful when we use the, the parameterization based on bean scheme because this uh, biases in the precipitation development can also propagate to the um, parameterized process rates. So in, in this work, we showed that this uh, subgrid model, what we use, uh, uh, um, can improve the, uh, basically um, compensate for the lower grid resolution and affect the dropping number concentration and spectral width, um, which is important for, again, uh, precipitation development and optical properties. And we also showed that secondary activation from entrainment um, affects the Doppler size distribution and, uh, and can have impact on precipitation development, optical properties, and as well as some feedback to the dynamics. So this information can be useful for uh, cumulus parameterization. Um, this Lagrangian microphysics scheme is, uh, um, is a feature for detailed uh, investigation of cloud properties because, uh, because uh, it has several advantages compared to the 
traditional oil and bean microphysics schemes. And uh, this can be used as a benchmark for uh, uh, developing parameterization for uh, different cloud processes. So in the last part of my talk, I'll be focusing on uh, how we can represent the subgrid scale supersaturation fluctuation better in LES and convection permitting models, and, uh, and also improve the uh, interaction of the cloud and turbulence in, in the, this high resolution models. So generally, in most of the LES and convection permitting model, when we, uh, when we model supersaturation fluctuation, we only consider the fluctuation driven from the vertical velocity. However, that's only one component of the overall variability of supersaturation. So vertical velocity fluctuation drives the fluctuation in hydrostatic uh, pressure uh, fluctuation and then uh, um, and temperature fluctuation, and that, uh, that gives the supersaturation variability. However, there are other contributions like fluctuation in the temperature, uh, at, uh, potential temperature, and uh, uh, water vapor mixing ratio, as well as their covariances. And all these terms are also important when there's a mixing process. So we propose a model based on the scalar variance and covariance prognosis, and uh, we obtain supersaturation variability based on that. And then to evaluate this new subgrid model, we perform direct numerical simulation of uh, pi cloud chamber uh, without droplet. And, uh, and then uh, we compare the LES subgrid model with the DNS results. So here's the equations that we solve. I'm not going to discuss every, everything in detail, but just it's basically the budget term of a different contribution like transport, production, diffusion, dissipation, and diabetic uh, heating. And, uh, and then uh, we, uh, we basically uh, assume area diffusivity model similar to uh, Subgrid TK model and then uh, solve these equations. So here's the comparison between the LES subgrid scale and as well as uh, uh, direct numerical simulation results. So we filter the DNS data using a spatial box filter and obtain filter and subfilter part. The, here the soil lines are from the LES and the dashed lines are from the DNS. So you can see that uh, both resolved scale as well as uh, subgrid scale fluctuation matches the DNS data uh, for water vapor temperature uh, fluctuation as well as the covariances. And uh, we obtain supersaturation variability based on uh, uh, combining the, uh, this uh, different terms and that also matches the DNS data reasonably well. There are some deviation near the boundaries and that's because uh, in DNS we use different diffusivities for water vapor and temperature. However, in uh, LES, we use same um, coefficient for the fluxes as well as same numerical diffusivities. And that's important, especially near the boundaries, so um, we get this deviation of the uh, fluctuation. Um, we, uh, to test the, their uh, sensitivity to the grid, is, uh, grid uh, spacing, we. Uh, we run this LES model with different grid spacing, and then I found that the subgrid scale fluctuation scale uh, appropriately related to the resolve scale fluctuations uh, when we change the grid spacing. So, in summary, like uh, this new subgrid model can represent the supersaturation fluctuation better, especially when there's a turbulent train mixing process, and uh, and the, this the DNS and LES setup. Uh, we develop for this pi cloud chamber or relay Bernard convection can be used further for cloud turbulence interaction as well as this multi-phase uh, flow problems in the, in the control setting. I'm also planning to use this setup for de design development of uh, another chamber that's uh, it's a project led by Michigan Tech and I'm planning to contribute through this uh, modeling uh, tools. So in conclusion, we showed that turbulent fluctuation is important for broadening of Doppler size distribution. And uh, uh, this, this broadening is uh, uh, important for uh, precipitation development as well as optical depth parameterization. And uh, we also obtained fo the theoretical solution of Doppler size distribution through uh, focal Planck equation. And that, that can also be useful for uh, uh, bulk parameterization as well as Zemo sensing retrievals. And the state-of-the-art model we develop uh, 
like basically we implemented super Doppler scheme in CM1 and uh, with subgrid model for particle transfer and super saturation fluctuation. Uh, that's, uh, and uh, this, this modeling tool has an advantage compared to the earlier and bean and bulk microphysics scheme and can serve as a benchmark for future parameterization development. And we also showed that subgrid scale turbulence uh, uh, is also important for cumulus cloud properties, uh, as well as entrainment and secondary activation of uh, uh, aerosol particle affects the spectral width, and, uh, uh, and that's, uh, that can affect the precipitation development and uh, radiative forcing. And we propose this new subgrid scale scheme for supersaturation fluctuation that can represent the uh, supersaturation variability from scalar mixing process better in LES and convection permitting models. And also it, will imp it can improve the interaction of the cloud droplet with the turbulent flow field. So currently I'm doing a direct numerical simulation of uh, pi cloud chamber with, uh, with droplets to understand the Lagrangian turbulence statistics as well as uh, impact of inertia on the different uh, turbulence statistics as well as uh, interaction between the turbulent flow field and cloud particles. And uh, I'm also um, working on the stratocumulus cloud transition from closed to open cell using a super Doppler scheme with uh, LES model. And, and in this project, we are investigating the uh, impact of aerosol processing and scavenging uh, in, in the transition process. As well as we are investi investigating the uh, evolution of Doppler size distribution at different location uh, during, uh, during this tran transition phase. Um, uh, recently, I also implemented piggy piggybacking approach in the CM1 where we can separate the impact of microphysics from the dynamics and uh, um, we are planning to use this setup for uh, investigating the stochastic fluctuation of collision coalescence process on uh, precipitation development as well as to, uh, uh, to compare the Lagrangian and bean microphysics scheme in more robust way. Um, recently, uh, we also got our ASG proposal approved, so uh, we are planning to do a very high resolution simulation of a boundary layer cloud as well as uh, the cumulus congestus cloud I showed earlier. Um, and, and we are planning to investigate the aerosol cloud turbulence interaction um, better in this high resolution modeling framework. So in, in the future, I'd like to uh, investigate aerosol cloud turbulence interaction in warm boundary layer clouds using this Lagrangian scheme and uh, this new subgrid model I proposed. Um, idea here uh, is to understand how the aerosol perturbation in different cloud system can impact the microscopic uh, properties as well as uh, microphysical properties. And uh, I'm also planning to use this, uh, uh, this setup for, uh, uh, for improved representation of the cloud properties in the uh, cloud processes in the uh, system models. Um, I'm also planning to investigate scalar variance and uh, supersaturation statistics especially in train, during entrainment mixing process using a, um, using a system, at, uh, using tools at uh, different scales, like a direct numerical simulation as well as larger simulations. And uh, um, we are also planning to investigate Arctic mixed phase cloud using Lagrangian microfix scheme and this with this new subgrid model. In, uh, and uh, we will investigate the impact of large scale circulation, aerosols and turbulent uh, turbulent fluctuation on uh, on their lifetime as well as uh, uh, their microphysical properties. So this will be my light, last slide. So uh, you might be wondering, like I showed so many different uh, pieces and how all those pieces fit together. Uh, this uh, this aerosol cloud turbulence interaction problem is a multi-scale, multi-system problem. So it requires this multi-scale, multi-system approach. And uh, so using this laboratory experiment as well as uh, this direct numerical simulation, we can understand the interaction of the cloud particle with turbulent flow field in the details. And this information can be used for subgrid modeling uh, in larger simulation framework. And this larger simulation framework with this improved representation of uh, subgrid scale interaction and with Lagrangian particle microphysics where uh, uh, we can represent the aerosol activation processing better 
um, we uh, we can understand the uh, this problem in a wider range of scales, uh, and uh, this information can be useful for sub subgrid modeling in large scale model as well as uh, um, yeah parameterization development for this weather prediction climate models, and this can be done using some physical based parameterization or through different machine learning approaches. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you for listening, and have, I'll be happy to answer your questions. All right, thanks, Kamal. Um, first in the room, do we have any questions? Um, hi, Kamal. Um, <clears throat> I was curious, how many Lagrangian super droplets do you need to uh, uh, capture the the interactions? Let's say, you know if it's a box that's a meter cubed versus a box that's a kilometer cubed. Can you can you give me a sense of how many super droplets you might need? Uh, yeah. So in the LES uh, simulation, like uh, in of this cumulus congested cloud, we use around 120 uh, super droplet per grid box. And the grid box is uh, basically uh, is of the order of 50 to 50 meter cube. Uh, and uh, and that's, uh, that I can say that's a, it's not like a um, really large number. It's a decent number. And uh, uh, there are some aspects which are not properly captured when you use low super droplet concentration, like, uh, for example, stochastic fluctuation in the collision coalescence process that require <laughs> Uh, high concentration of the super droplet. However, for condensation growth and uh, aerosol processing, maybe that number is reasonable. And um, yeah, and for um, for large scale model again, like um, um, we need to think about uh, this uh, turbulent and uh, uh, the super doppler interaction because when you use low concentration again. Um, there's some sort of averaging effect because one super droplet represents multiple particles. So if you use low uh, super droplet concentration, then there will be more averaging of that f impact of fluctuations. Yeah. So we have a question coming in from online from Roy Rasmussen. Uh, Roy asks, can you use this framework to study the impact of turbulence on ice formation? Um, uh, y yes, like uh, that's what we are planning to do in uh, in one of the project uh, we um, submitted to ASR. So we like to understand how the subgrid scale fluctuation impacts the microphysical properties. For example, um, phase partitioning, and um, and whether that can help sustain more liquid phase, uh, because in the fluctuating environment you can have uh, um, super saturation for for water vapor for some particles, uh, and so, and this, there'll be subsaturation for uh, other particles, and then you can have both. Uh, it can sustain both phases uh, because of that. So we'd like to investigate those sort of problem um, in in this uh, project, um, and also like um, this Lagrangian scheme can be useful for uh, yeah more detailed study of ice phase physics. Of course, there are also assumption in the ice phase physics like nucleation. Uh, of ice particles um, that uh, still need to be improved. But yeah, um, definitely like for interaction between turbulent and um, ice particle, it will be a nice tool. Yeah. Couldn't that be full soup? Could you please Couldn't that be studied experimentally in the pie chamber? Uh, the ice phase physics? Um, yes, like um, only problem is like in the pie chamber, uh, the vertical dimension is uh, one meter, so um, the lifetime of the particle is limited, so you you can't grow particle to a larger size. Um, so, so that's a problem. We did one ex mixed phase cloud experiment earlier, um, but uh, yeah, we can't grow them. Uh, we can't grow ice particle bigger. Um, either you have to have bigger chamber, or you can. Uh, grow some particle and then drop those particle in the chamber and study their interaction with the maybe like the cloud droplet and other ice particle which is there, smaller ice particle. Yeah. Uh, so we have another question from online from uh, Lulun Shui. 
Um, Lulin asks, great talk, Kamal. In my opinion, SDM is the most appropriate way to investigate aerosol cloud interactions. Any plan to look into the problem of cloud processing of aerosols? Uh, yes, thanks, Lulin. Like, uh, uh, that's what we are doing uh, for, for this uh, strategic cumulus project. Like, uh, we are investigating how this aerosol processing affecting the transition from close to open cell. And, um, and here in the Lagrange scheme, you can look at the changes in the aerosol uh, distribution through processing and, uh, and also you can have better representation on the scavenging. So uh, we are using this uh, also along with the uh, Taubin microphysics so that we can see um, what are the processes we are uh, not properly capturing the beam scheme. Uh, for in the bean scheme, we have to assume uh, some um, artificial way of uh, scavenging and processing. So uh, we are investig investigating that in, for this uh, you know, this transition project. Yeah. Other questions in the room? I guess I'll ask a question. Um, so. My background is more with wharf modeling and mesoscale modeling. So, uh, I guess, have you, have you, how much have you tried, or, or what are the prospects of uh, implementing this uh, Lagrangian uh, superparticle modeling into, uh, you know, mesoscale uh, schemes within wharf? And do you have uh, maybe anything to say about what grid spacing would be advisable, or where this might break down? Yeah, um, so the, initially when we implemented this uh, into CM1, like uh, we, uh, the initial plan was to implement in WARF, uh, but we choose CM1 because it's much simpler and uh, more, uh, more uh, better for I, uh, this idealized uh, simulations. Um, it's like for the large scale model, it's challenging because then um, the subgrid interactions are like uh, once you had to parameterize, right? Like, uh, so I'm not sure like uh, um, how much good you'll get when you use Lagrangian scheme for the very large grid box. I think for that, maybe bulk scheme would be much better, um, I guess, because anyway, like you're not resolving the interactions better. Thanks. Do we have any more questions? Nothing, nothing online. Uh, so with that, um, what, oh, there's one, is there one more coming in, Jenny? All right, CC beating the clock. Uh, so a question from CC Chen. Hi, Kamal, excellent talk. Maybe I missed it, but can the DNS or LES of the pie chamber deal with constant aerosol injection instead of introducing aerosols only in the initial time? Oh yes, like uh, we 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 are uh, using like a constant aerosol injection for uh, this simulations. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you, Kamal, for um, for your seminar, and uh, thanks for all the questions, uh, both here in the room and online. Um, yeah, and if anyone, uh, if you or a colleague would be interested in giving a RAL seminar, just uh, please email me, jaredlee at ucar.edu, and uh, we'll try to do them hybrid if we can, or if the presenter is remote, we'll uh, do it fully on Zoom. But uh, once again, thank you, Kamal, thank for you. a great, uh, great seminar. Yeah, thank you for having me here.